Well, for this last piece about common probability distributions, we're going to start with a couple of terms, shortfall risk, and then we're going to look at the safety first ratio, or ROY's safety first ratio. So let's look at these definitions. Shortfall risk is simply the probability that a portfolio return or a portfolio value will be below some target return or target value. So here's a portfolio, the target return is 5%. What's the probability of a return less than 5%? That's the shortfall risk. We could also do it with values. Say, well, here's the portfolio. It's a $160,000 portfolio. What's the probability that it's going to be less, that the value is going to be less than 150000 at the end of the period? Shortfall risk. Roy's safety first ratio is the number of standard deviations that this target return, sometimes called the threshold return, is below the expected return or the expected value. And it's calculated as this. The expected return on the portfolio, we're doing it in returns now rather than value. So the expected return on the portfolio minus this target or threshold return divided by the standard deviation of portfolio returns. Well, that is just simply the number of standard deviations below the expected value. So we've got a little backwards here. If it comes out to be 3, okay, then we're 3 standard deviations below. And uh, if that were the risk-free rate, that gets us right back to what we studied as the Sharpe ratio, right? Excess returns per unit of risk. So just trying to tie those concepts together to make it a little easier to remember them, recall them, and uh, uh, pull them up as necessary. So if that target return was a risk-free rate, the safety first ratio is also the sharp ratio. Now I want to tie these two concepts together. That is, a larger safety first ratio means lower shortfall risk. So we've got three portfolios here. And portfolio A has an expected return of 9% and a standard deviation of 12%. Portfolio B, expected return of 11, standard deviation of 20. So it has a higher expected return, but it also has higher risk. And portfolio C has a lower expected return, but it also has lower risk. So remember, when we had this problem or looked at this problem before of choosing among portfolios, we use that coefficient of variation, standard deviation per unit of return, and we use the Sharpe ratio, excess return per unit of risk, per unit of standard deviation. So now we're going to use this third method, the safety first ratio. So first let's calculate that safety first ratio. Okay. Well, here it's 0.5, here it's 0.4, and here it's 0.44. So remember, the interpretation of this safety first ratio is this is how many standard deviations below the mean. So which do we like better? Well, we like the one that's furthest below the mean. Because, I can do a little of my famous artwork here for you. Here's our mean return. And so our safety first ratio is the number of standard deviations below the mean. So the more standard deviations below the mean, the less probability is in that left-hand tail. So the lower, prob lower the probability of getting a return less than the threshold return. That's our RL right there. And so I've added to this table the probability of the shortfall. It's not really part of this LOS, but if you look, this is our standard normal operator, and that's just going to tell us the probability. We could go on the table, right? This is 0.5 standard deviations. We could look up on the Z table, our standard normal table, 
what's the probability of being more than 0.5 standard deviations below the mean. And that turns out to be 30.85%. And you can see for smaller values of Roy's safety first ratio, the probabilities of being below that threshold return are greater. So that's why we say we like the larger, we like the portfolio with the larger safety first ratio because that's the most standard deviations below the mean and the smallest percentage of the three of getting a return less than 3% here, our threshold return here of 3%. Our next LOS here has to do with the log normal distribution. Now, why do we care about the log normal distribution? Well, we care because when we model returns, or we want, say we want to model a stock price. Well, prices don't go below zero. And we know our normal distribution goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So maybe that's not the best distribution for modeling uh, the return on a uh, portfolio. Even if we're even with returns, we can only go to minus a hundred percent. We can't go to minus infinity. But especially for modeling prices, which are bounded by zero, we like to use the log normal because, as you can see here from this diagram, it is bounded by zero. It is never negative, so it works well for modeling prices. So why do we call it the log normal? Where does it come from? Well. A log normal random variable, if we take the natural logarithm of each of them, those natural logarithms are a normal distribution. Another way to put this, if we want to generate a log normal distribution, we take this mathematical E, and if we generated X, and all the X's are normally distributed, then E to the X is distributed log normally. So it's always positive and used for modeling price relatives. One plus the return. Well, since the return can only be minus 100% at worst, that means this is bounded by zero because one minus 100% is zero. Now we want to look at continuous compounding. Remember, we had the compounding frequency. And we found, OK, we did annual, then we did semi-annual, monthly, weekly, daily. The more frequent the compounding period, the greater the effective annual return. So we looked at that before. What is continuous compounding? Well, mathematically, it's really the limit as we take this frequency and make it more and more frequent or looked at the other way, take our periods, make them smaller and smaller and smaller. So our compounding period, daily, hourly, every minute, every second, the limit of that is continuous compounding. And we're going to say that the continuously compounded rate is the log, the natural logarithm, of 1 plus the holding period return. As an example, a one-year holding period return is 20 percent. Okay, so that's an effective annual return. But we want the stated annual return with continuous compounding that's equivalent to that. So our continuously compounded stated rate is the log of 1 plus our holding period return at 20 percent, which is 18.23. So now the story becomes, if the stated rate on a continuously compounded basis is 18.23 percent, our effective annual return is 20 percent. So we can go backwards, right? Um, we've got the log of ending value over beginning value. Remember, that is 1 plus the holding peri period return. Take 
natural logarithm of that. It's on your calculator. It's a function there. Get 18.23%. So 18.23% stated annual rate, continuous compounding, we come up with 20%. So we're going to take e to the x. So that, we're going from the stated rate to the effective rate. Actually, the learning outcome statement, I think, just requires us to go from a holding period rate to the stated rate on a continuous compounding basis. Monte Carlo simulation. What is that? Well, as computers get uh, more powerful and uh, easier to get to, they came up this, with this simulation as a way to do some estimation, an estimation of probability distributions. So with the Monte Carlo simulation, we specify the distributions of the random variables. So maybe we want to value an option. and We don't really know how to do that in a closed form way. But we do know that these options, their values depend on interest rates and on the underlying stock price. So for a Monte Carlo simulation, we're going to say, OK, let's assume these stock prices are distributed log normally. And we put in some parameters for a log normal distribution. So it'll just generate stock price or stock price changes. And then we've got interest rates. We'll say, well, interest rates are bounded by 0, 2. Maybe we want them to be uh, um, log normal as well, but with different parameters. But whatever our, our risk variables are, we need to model them and say, OK, they follow this distribution, and here's the mean, here's the variance, here's the skewness, here's the kurtosis. And uh, then we, to, we turn to the computer and say, well, OK, from these two distributions, grab one value for interest rates and one value for the stock price. Then we take those values, plug them into our formula to value the option, and we get an option value. And then we repeat this, say, 10,000 times, or the computer repeats this 10,000 times. So now we've got 10,000 option values, and it should be some sort of distribution. And then we look at that distribution and say, what's the mean of it? The mean of that distribution of those 10,000 outcomes, that's our expected option value. And the distribution of all those 10,000 values, we can measure, calculate the variance of those. That's going to be the variance of the option value. So we calculate the mean and variance of the d distribution of outcome, outcomes that we've generated by assuming distributions of our, let's call them variables of interest here, the ones that are driving the value of the option that we're interested in. So now we need to differentiate this from historical simulation. It's similar to Monte Carlo simulation, but our random variables for our distributions, we're going to look at historical data. So we may look at historical interest rates and historical asset prices and say, OK, we're going to pick randomly from these. And we don't have to specify the distributions or the parameters. We're just really assuming that that distribution is going to be like it was in the past, so we can just draw from past values. That's the historical in historical simulation. Now, the disadvantage is that future outcomes for these risk factors may be outside this historical range. So if that distribution of interest rates changes for some reason, and we're drawing from the historical distribution, well, that's not going to work out too well. 